So I heard um, about a wife, and she asked her husband, Honey, is it just me, or is the cat getting fatter? And the husband answered, It's just you, honey. <laughs> okay, let me be balanced. <laughs> the husband tells his wife, Honey, I have a bag full of used clothing I'm going to donate. And the wife says, why don't you just throw it out? That's much easier. And he says, but there are poor, starving people who could use these clothes. And the wife says, honey, if they could fit your clothes, they ain't starving. <laughs> now you all are groanings over two jokes about people that told the other person a truth. But isn't that exactly what God told us to do? Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. If you don't understand it, they cleared it up Leviticus. You shall not lie to one another. <coughs> right there in the Bible. You know, we, we all value the importance of honesty. Unless it's a truth, we have to hear. Right? Or when uh, we don't want to have to be the one that's got to tell someone else the hard truth. What's that expression? The truth only hurts when you want to believe a lie. Powerful, right? So that begs the question, how do we respond when we're forced to face these hard truths, whether they're from someone we love or if it's from God? This is uh, the third week of our sermon series on strong, courageous women in the Bible. And today I want to introduce you to Hulda. She wasn't brave in the sense like Jael was last week in battle. And she's not brave as in the sense of Shipra and Pua who had to deny the Pharaoh and rescue the kids from being killed, the little boys. No, Hulda is famous for one thing. She told the truth to a king. But you have to understand context that hold us time. We're going to be reading later from 2 Kings chapter 22. So if you want to turn in the Bible now, it'll save you time later. 2 Kings chapter 22. Hold the lid during a time of uh, King Josiah. <clears throat> so this is around 640 to 609 BC. So this is about 600 years before Christ was born. Now let me paint a little picture for you about how dire the situation was during King Josiah's time. Josiah's grandfather's name was Manasseh. And he is known as the most wicked kings in all of Judean history. <coughs> he led the entire nation of Judah into deep, deep idolatry. He even had his own son sacrificed on the altar of Baal. The people, they worshiped the false gods. The temple itself, the temple was about 300 years old at that time. It started to crumble. It went into disrepair. Who needs a temple? And after Manasseh's long reign, his son Ammon came on the scene, and he was just as wicked as his father. But he'd only been king for two years, and he was assassinated. So that uh, Amon's son had a kind of power. He was eight years old. Eight years old. But the Bible says that Josiah had a heart for God. And it turns out by the time he's 16, his heart's growing stronger and he's starting to try to figure out how to purge these idols from uh, the city. I said he was 16. He started to get a heart for God. Isn't that a lot that we're seeing now in our time? These high school kids getting baptized, the high school, college, young college kids, thousands of them being mass baptized. It seems to be a time when a lot of people understand fully that there is a God. And so that's where we are with Josiah. And by the time he's 20, he orders that that temple that was crumbling be restored. And this is where the story gets interesting because it's during the restoration 
that the priests were digging and they, what do you know, they, they wandered across a copy of an old ancient document and they called the Book of Law. Now, it's not really clear in Scripture what that Book of Law was. Some think it's the entire Pentateuch. Other people, and I would agree, think it's mostly just a copy of Deuteronomy. The Scripture says that when Joshua heard the Book of Law read to him, he was devastated. And if you know anything about Deuteronomy, especially chapter 28, this is the chapter where it talks about the reward for obedience to God. And it talks about the destruction that will happen if you disobey God. And I'm guessing Josiah read the, the curses and said, uh-oh, we're in big trouble. Because uh, in the text it says that he, he rented his clothes, he tore his garment, he was in such grief. And Josiah desperately wanted to know, okay, if, if this is really going to happen, if we've been this wicked, and this is the punishment, how can we stop this? I need a prophet, he thought. And that's where Holda comes into our story. Holda was a prophetess. And they, uh, she's a woman, one of seven women recognized as a Jewish prophet. And then we don't know much about Holda except that she was very well positioned within the kingdom because her husband was in charge of the royal garments. And she lived in a good part of the city, so we know she was in the social connections. And by the way, she, she was actually living at the same time as Jeremiah and uh, Zephaniah. So there's all these prophets there. But they go see Hulda. Why would they ask for Hulda? We don't know. Perhaps it's because of her wisdom. Perhaps she had like this really sterling reputation as a, as a prophetess. Perhaps because it was a woman and the king thought maybe she was people kind to me. But for other reason, Hulda was the one that was trusted to deliver God's message. And this is where I think her bravery really shines. <clears throat> you have to understand that delivering a prophetic message that you know is not going to be good news to a king in those days was not something you wanted to do. Ahab's wife Jezebel, she had hundreds and hundreds of prophets killed because she didn't like what they had to say. <clears throat> Sometimes it's hard to tell someone the truth when you know they don't really want to hear it. Can I get an amen? amen? So if you turn to 2 Kings 22, verse 14, I'm going to tell you about how the message he gave to the king. It says, Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Messiah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, the son of Harvas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. So there you go. You see, she's got connections, right? She's, she's got the inn. Certainly the king knew of her. In the same circles. Maybe that's why he called on her. He's comfortable with her. Maybe she'd never really given him any bad advice before. We don't know. But here's what she said. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, tell the man who sent you to me. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people. According to everything written in the book, the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. <clears throat> so she sends the message to the man. Did you all catch that? She doesn't say, go tell the king, she doesn't say, go tell the royal highness. She says, go tell the man. 
And here's an interesting fact. History doesn't even tell us what Holda's real name was. This is a name she was given after this event. It means weasel. Holda the weasel. Because she told harsh words to the king. Because she dared to stand up to the king. She, she dared to remind him that he's just human. Forever known as the weasel. This tells you something about her bravery, doesn't it? This isn't something you do lightly in that time. I can just imagine the pressure she was under. She had to deliver this message of judgment to a king knowing she could be put to death. But God's message was clear. Judgment was coming because of Judah's idolatry. But then she delivers a personal message to Isaiah. She says, tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, not at least the king of Judah, not the man. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard the word, when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, therefore I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. What do you all think, see about how Hulda handled herself? Well, she didn't let fear stop her, did she? Second, she, she spoke the truth that God had given to her to speak. Did she sugarcoat it? Did she water down the message? She could have said all kinds of little soft little things to kind of try to protect herself, but she didn't, did she? Because sometimes telling the truth is hard. And sometimes hearing the truth is hard. When we read this scripture and we understand all the bravery, it reminds us that speaking the truth can be risky. It can be dangerous. But if you do it with what God put on your heart, God will take care of the outcome. If you read the rest of the chapter, what you're going to learn is that Josiah was humble. And he went and he publicly read Deuteronomy, if it was Deuteronomy, to all the people. He says, we have to change our ways. The prophet has said, we are going to be destroyed. We have this window of opportunity, and that's what they did. For a very short period of time, they started worshiping the one and true God. How many of you all ever had to have that dreaded conversation with a coworker? I had to let a man go one time. We called him the cat man. He was eccentric. He didn't involve the cats. And all I like to do is talk about his gun collection. And I had to fire him. And he cried in my office. And we had to have a guard at the door the next week. Giving people bad news sometimes it can be hard and it can be dangerous. Maybe you've had to tell a family member about the death of another family member or a close family friend. You all didn't want to do it, did you? The last thing you want to do is be the bearer of bad news. All these little idioms we have. But sometimes we have to tell people the hard truths because a person needs to hear those things for their own growth. And if we, if we trust in God when we hear his call, those truths, they, they can lead to transformation. They can lead to healing. <clears throat> I want to give you all three takeaways today from Holda's story. Now, I've said this before. I'm never sure who these sermons are for. The last night I was working on the, my sermon, this part didn't exist, and 
God said, this is important stuff to say. So our first takeaway is to be brave and speak the truth, including to ourselves. Like called, we're called to speak the truth even when it's difficult. Sometimes the hardest person that you need to get through to is yourself. Peter tells us in Ephesians, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. So speaking in truth means to deliver the hard messages with, with compassion, not with harshness. How many of you have adult children that you need to have a tough talk with? Perhaps they're facing issues of financial irresponsibility. Or maybe they're in toxic relationships. Or, or maybe they're, uh, uh, in, they have really unhealthy habits. Are you just going to deny what you're seeing? Or are you going to have the courage to let them put, uh, tell them what God has put on your heart to say? But you have to love them when speak the truth. And you have to honor guidance with, with honesty and grace. What about yourself? Are you being honest about your own needs for grace and guidance? The second takeaway away is to trust in God's protection. Because Jesus already took away our judgment. Hold the trust that God was going to protect her. And, and so she didn't let that keep her from disobeying God. That it, we, we can do the same thing because we have the same strength. But we already have the promise of Jesus Christ as our protector and Savior. The judgment Huldah received. And, and, the, and the decimation that came across all of Judah. It came to pass. Our judgment was taken away by Christ on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. See how easy that is? You already have that promise. There is your source of strength. To tell those hard truths. To look into that mirror and do your own self-reflections. Psalm 56, 11 says, In God I trust, and I'm not afraid. What can man do to me? How many of you are facing a situation where fear is holding you back from the truth? You stay silent with fear, or will you be brave knowing that Christ gave them all so that you can lean on him? The third takeaway this morning is respond to hard truths with humility because repentance leads to grace. What did Josiah do when he got the bad news? He responded with humility. He responded with repentance. What do you all do when you're faced with the hard truth? If it comes from a loved one, if it comes from a friend, if it comes from God putting something on your heart, how do you respond? Do you have a humble heart or do you push back? I know, Mom, I need to get a job. Get off my back. Yeah, you're right, Dad. He's, he's way too abusive, but you just don't understand him. Or do you answer this way? You're right. It's time for me to pull up my bootstraps and be the man that you want me to be. You're right, Dad. I'm going to try and see if I can get him to Christian counseling. And if that doesn't work, will you help me? James reminds us, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. 
How many of you all had to tell the truth you didn't want to tell? How many of you all heard something you didn't want to hear? Did you respond? Or did you react? If life is moving you to be like Hulda, right now you're facing situations where you need to tell someone the hard news. Be brave. Speak the truth. Even if it's yourself that needs to hear the message. And trust in God's protection. Jesus gave it all. If you're more like Josiah, and you know that that hard truth is coming soon, you know you're going to hear it. Respond to hard truths with humility, because it's the repentance that leads to the grace. We're getting ready to celebrate our, our feast of the Lord's table in just a few minutes. And I, I want to close with some thoughts for how we can prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The ESV is supposed to be the easy translation. The NIV, I think, is easier. It says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So before you come up here, examine yourself. Where are you in your relationship with okay. him? This is a time to confess your sins and, and turn your back to God with humble hearts. Just as Josiah responded with hard truth and repentance, you're invited to do the same thing today in our Lord's meal. This is the time you take to confess your sins. This is the time you take to lift up your joys and thanksgiving. This is the time you take to petition for others that you're carrying in your heart. This was the most holy week of the weeks. Communion Sunday. It's my favorite. And when I take that communion at the very end, I know I'm cleansed. How refreshing and blissful is that? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in humility. We acknowledge our need for your grace. Like, like Josiah, we recognize that we've fallen short and we repent of our sins. Thank you for sending Jesus. Who took our judgment upon himself so we could be forgiven. As we partake in this communion today, remind us of the depth of your love and the power of your grace. Cleanse us, renew us, and draw us closer to you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.